Hello, and welcome to this uh, webinar hosted by the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, my name is Matt Rooney, and I am Engineering Policy Advisor at the IMAG. And today we're going to be discussing community energy and specifically asking the question will it play a significant role in our future energy system? I'm joined by Andre Pino, and Andre has co founded various London based community energy projects and is a long-standing member of the IMAGE's Energy, Environment and Sustainability Group. This is a very topical subject for discussion. As we know, there have been climate change protests going on all around the world this year, including outside our London offices. Um, as we are based in London and the UK, this presentation will have a British focus, but we hope that there are members dialing in from all around the world, and we would love to have your feedback about what's going on in different countries. So the presentation itself today will last around half an hour and then we hope to have around 20 minutes for a Q&A session after that. So please do send your questions in as we go along. So the presentation itself is divided into four sections. We will first introduce the concept of community energy itself. We will then present some example case studies that involve community energy and just local energy technologies in general. Thirdly, the inspiration for this webinar was a uh, community renewable energy uh, workshop that we held in the IMEG earlier in the year, and this is a follow-on from that. And we will also uh, present outputs from that and a policy report that we published in September on local energy. And finally, I will pass over to Andre, who will try to answer the question, can community energy scale up, or how might it scale up in the future? So to introduce community energy, I will pass on to Andre for this, because he has presented some very good slides. So Andre? Hi, everyone. Um, so the diagram on your left uh, represents the model that most community energy organizations use today. Uh, so this is a model where people invest and they buy shares uh, in these organizations uh, and then the money raised is used to buy the equipment, so it could be solar panels or a wind turbine for example, um, and then the shareholders or, or members as they're known uh, get an interest from uh, the money that's made every year. So this particular diagram is from Brixton Energy. This is a, a group of cooperatives that I co-founded co um, in London. Um, and this is known as an equity model, um, which is, I guess, most people would refer to this as, as, as the model, uh, as community energy. Uh, but I, I wanted to point out that community energy is not just about equity and, or ownership. Um, so the diagram on your right actually represents a variety of different models uh, for community energy um, organizations uh, beyond equity. So they can be described by the amount of impact that they each have on the community they serve. So the further up you go on the y-axis, uh, that means the higher governance impact it has on the community. The further right you go to the x-axis, uh, the higher the positive financial impact it has on the community. And then the size of the bubble indicates uh, so the bigger the bubble indicates the bigger social impact. Uh, so this means helping vulnerable people and bringing other benefits beyond energy. Um, and I think this is just important to create context because it's not just about investment uh, and the financial side of things. Um, so models one to six um, uh, could create hybrid models. So you can see model number seven, for example, uh, is, is the impact created by combining some of these models together. Um, and the most successful community energy projects are a combination. They are hybrid models. They're not just about equity. Um, so that's just something that we, you know, the big takeaway here is we shouldn't look at community energy as just a financial uh, benefit vehicle. Uh, the EU defines community energy in three different ways, uh, so I also wanted to clarify this. So um, the, first, the first one is self-consumption. This would be an individual uh, that installs its own generation for 
his own self-consumption, his or hers own self-consumption. Um, the second model is, or the second definition is collective self-consumption. And this is something the EU has been pushing quite recently, which is to allow uh, communities to consume from a communal asset. So you could have a block of flats that has a communal uh, solar photovoltaic installation, um, and each resident could consume their share of, of that generation. Or, for example, a village that has a local wind turbine, um, and they could consume uh, directly from that wind turbine. So there's some particular regulatory changes that are required in several countries in order for this model or this definition to become reality. Uh, the EU has implemented a new directive, um, so they're, pu they're pushing this quite hard, um, and we'll definitely see it growing uh, across member states. And we've got the last definition is the one that we mostly know uh, as community energy. So it's where uh, a group of people uh, set up a local energy project, um, and and this, you know, that project can come from a variety of different technologies. Thanks, Andre. So this next slide is taken from Community Energy England and their State of the Sector report, and it shows the number of community energy schemes that have taken off around the country. And there are quite a few, but in the grand scheme of things, in terms of total UK capacity, community energy is quite small at the moment. But over many years, uh, community energy has had support from government. This is a quote from the previous Energy Minister, Claire Perry, who said that community energy is a key cornerstone of the government's ambition for transitioning to a low carbon smart energy system. Claire is no longer Energy Minister, but she will still be heavily involved in UK energy policy as she will be president of COP26, the UN's climate change conference, which the UK will be hosting in 2020. I should also say that we've been quite lucky in the UK to have cross-party support for action on climate change. So all of the main parties in the UK support uh, urgent action to reduce carbon emissions, and we're quite lucky in this country in that extent, and all parties have expressed support for local and community energy. So what has made community energy possible in the past? So we have government policies starting all the way from research and development, so grants from, for example, UK Research and Innovation, uh, demonstrator programs from the likes of the Energy Systems Catapults, and these won't necessarily be community schemes, but they develop the technologies that might develop the community energy schemes of the future. In terms of community energy specifically, we have the Rural Community Energy Fund and similar schemes. But the big two policies that have really allowed uh, community and local energy to take off have been the Renewable Heat Incentive and the Feed-in Tariff. And these are direct subsidies for small-scale generators of low-carbon heat and electricity. Now, the feed-in tariff was withdrawn by the government earlier in the year, which was a blow to small-scale developers, particularly of solar. But the new policy, the replacement called the Smart Export Guarantee, will be brought in in 2020, and I'll talk about that a little later in the presentation. So moving on to some example case studies, which have been written about in our local energy report. I divided these case studies into three categories, the first being single technology, uh, local energy projects often subsidized. The second is remote and island communities. Now these communities in the UK are often not connected to the gas grid and occasionally not even connected to the electricity grid. They might have high levels of fuel poverty. So there's a strong incentive for these communities to move quickly in developing their own local uh, heat and electricity systems. And finally, the category that's most exciting is whole system uh, projects that might involve storage, demand response, smart energy management, and these could be embedded within cities and towns. Now, the first of these case studies is a single technology 
which is the West Mill Solar Cooperative. This was originally a private venture, but it was purchased by the co-op in 2012, and they claimed that at the time this was the largest community energy scheme in the world with a 5 megawatt output. In this scheme, the profits uh, from selling electricity are returned to the members by interest, and a portion of this is also retained for a community benefit fund. One of the most exciting island communities is Orkney. And Orkney has long been a pioneer in community energy, particularly in wind. And they now, with wind and tidal, generate more electricity on average across the year than they can use themselves. And they had to decide what to do with this excess renewable electricity. And they decided to use it to produce hydrogen. So one of the islands has an electrolyzer which produces hydrogen and this is transported to the mainland uh, and it produces electricity for uh, powering some auxiliary systems on the ferry. So they only produce a small amount of hydrogen right now, but as this scales up, more and more hydrogen could be produced for providing, for example, a transport fuel or uh, fuel for home heating. And this is the hydrogen project is called Surf and Turf, and this is part of a larger reflex project which aims to create a smart energy island across the whole of Orkney. Thirdly, we have El Hierro in the Canary Islands. So they also produce a lot of uh, intermittent renewable electricity. So they decided to build a, a pumped hydro storage facility. And that picture shows the upper reservoir under construction. So when they have excess renewable electricity, they pump water up the hill. And at times of high demand or low renewable electricity output, they will release the water to produce electricity again. And moving on to more whole system schemes, one interesting project is, is seen in Nottingham. This is a new housing estate that aims to prove that you can produce a smart energy, efficient housing estate subsidy free. So the concept is that they have solar panels everywhere in inverted commas, so on, on roofs and ground, on any viable area of land. They have a community battery for storing electricity. And interestingly, they have a community energy hub where residents can go along to learn about the technologies that are used in the housing estates. And finally, and importantly, they collect lots of data. Uh, so they measure the weather, for example, the solar irradiance. And inside the properties, they also measure, for example, energy usage and carbon emissions from the, house, from the houses and apartments. And this is used by Nottingham University and analyzed to determine uh, how households use uh, energy. And this can be used in the future to optimize energy usage and make, it, make the estate more efficient. And finally, moving to a much larger scale, we have Project LEO Local Energy Oxfordshire. This is around 90 demonstration projects across the county and involved in this are uh, both the city's universities, both the city and uh, county council, various energy companies and technology companies, and there's community involvement through the organization called Low Carbon Hub. Uh, so this is aiming to demonstrate the so-called DNO to DSO transition, which I will talk about later in the presentation, but basically it's about how we're moving from a system of electricity production which is very centralized and with one-way flow of electricity to a more distributed system that is smart management and two-way flows of electricity. For example, with peer-to-peer -peer trading or vehicle-to-grid, which one of the demonstration projects aims to prove the concept of vehicle-to-grid, so that it's using the batteries from electric vehicles to store electricity during times of high renewable electricity output and to release it when it is required. So moving on to, uh, like I said, the inspiration for this webinar, which was our iMacKey Community Renewable Energy Workshop earlier in the year. So this brought together around 40 experts from the community energy sector. Um, there we had about seven uh, formal presentations, then two breakout sessions in which various questions were put to delegates about community energy. 
and eventually this led to uh, feeding into our local energy reports. And I should say that all of the slides from this uh, workshop, the output from the breakout sessions and the report can be downloaded from our website. So one of the questions we put to our delegates was what do you think the benefits of community energy are? And five of the main answers are given here and divided into categories. So the first is financial. This means that the, the dividends from community energy projects can be reinvested in the local community. Secondly is consumer buy-in. So often uh, local energy projects can encounter resistance and a way of increasing support for such projects is by engaging with the local population and even giving them a stake in it. Thirdly, cost. So local and community energy schemes will not always be cheaper, but in many cases they can be depending on the local circumstances. Like earlier I said, remote communities is a very good example of this. Fourth, engagement and education. So these schemes can make people aware of how they use energy and also be used to educate young people in engineering and technology. For example, in the Orkney Islands, the local college uh, uses the Surf and Turf project to educate students in, tech, in hydrogen technologies. And finally, uh, community energy schemes can create jobs to the local people and develop their skills. So we also asked what the challenges of community energy could be. This, again, is a, is a figure from Community Energy England who have summarized what they think are the main challenges for developers. Uh, I would just like to highlight uh, two or three of these. Firstly, skills, which is something the IMAGI are very passionate about. Um, and in community energy uh, projects, often the relevant skills can be lacking. Uh, this is partially because there's a high volunteer to professional ratio, so 10 to 1 by 1 estimate. So in order to get the right skills in terms of project management or finance or engineering, they might rely on the experts giving their expertise for free, which is fantastic, but it might not be scalable as we move to larger uh, community energy projects and they are deployed more widely. Another challenge is often finance. And this starts with whether the government policies are correct. So, for example, the withdrawal of the feed-in tariff was very damaging to lots of community energy developers. But there's also a lack of funding for the early stages of community energy projects and finding investment from the community can also be challenging. And community energy projects are often long-term investments and illiquid assets which can make them uh, not always the most attractive investments, depending on the type of investor. Um, Andre, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so uh, I guess one of the challenges is when you're asking the local community to invest, you're asking them to invest for a period of 20 to 30 years, and that's you know a long time to lock capital into a project. And so, you know, someone has a you know is planning to buy a house in five years, for example, uh, this is probably not a good investment for them to make because of that. Our final challenge, this isn't necessarily a challenge just for developers themselves, but a challenge for everyone in moving the whole system from a, a highly centralized electricity system to a more distributed model. And this is what we're, this is what is called, referred to in the UK as the DNO, the DSO transition. So as I said before, the traditional DNO model and how our electricity system has worked for many decades was a low number of connections to so large uh, power stations primarily. Electricity flows just in one direction. Uh, management is reactive and there was a low level of consumer engagement. So consumers just pay their bill when they get it at the end of the three months. And the new model, which will become challenging to manage, will be means a huge increase in small-scale renewable generation, so thousands and thousands of small-scale generators all around the country. Electricity will begin to flow in, in both directions, well, already has with rooftop solar, for example, but with vehicle-to-grid that could increase. Uh, and households will be encouraged to uh, manage their own energy. So we're deploying, for example, uh, 
smart meters in every household in the country and consumers will be encouraged to engage uh, to generate their own electricity, to store their own energy and things like that. And we also asked delegates at our workshop how the IMACE can help with developing and deploying community energy and various answers were given, uh, the top one being acting as technical advisors. Obviously, a professional institution like the IMACE has lots of expertise in this area. We can also help by convening people across sectors. We have 120,000 members across many sectors, not just energy, but every sector of engineering and just like with our community renewable energy workshop we can help to bring people together across these sectors to share information and also we can help by producing resources so that we can learn from previous projects so that community energy evolves and becomes more successful that we learn what works and what doesn't. At this point I'd like uh, if you have any suggestions for what the IMAG could do to help please write them in the box and please do keep adding your questions as we go along. Uh, finally, if you would like to read what the chair of our Energy, Environment and Sustainability Group wrote about this, you can see his blog on our website. That's Rupert Blackstone. So in our local energy report, we uh, made five headline recommendations. So you, again, you can download this report, it's about 15 pages long, but I will just summarize the main recommendations. The first was that the, uh, the development of the Smart Export Guarantee Policy should be made a priority and it should be made to work for community energy schemes of, of all scales. So hopefully this should lead to smart tariffs uh, being offered to consumers so that they can um, save money by using electricity off-peak, basically. Secondly, a review of the planning system. One of the presentations on our workshop was from Ambergate Hydro, and it highlighted some of the barriers that can be put in front of community energy schemes. And we know that renewable uh, energy projects have high level of rejection rates for planning permission. Thirdly, build the evidence base. So in particular with uh, local government schemes, it was found that often they do not have the time or budget to complete evaluations after a local energy project is implemented, so we don't get as much learning as we would like. Uh, our fourth recommendation was on energy modeling. So at different scales, if you model at a continental scale, a national scale, a local scale, or even a household scale, you will get different answers on the optimum mix of technologies depending on what level you model at. So this modeling work needs to be brought together uh, so that we know what the right answer is at different scales and understand why this is. Uh, for example, the energy systems catapult recommend local energy planning where you take into account the characteristics of the local region in planning your energy strategies. Finally, we recommend that university estates should be used as test beds for, for new uh, energy technologies. Uh, the reasons for this are that universities own lots of buildings and lots of land and they use lots of energy uh, and by their own admission many are failing to meet their own decarbonisation targets. Secondly, they have the expertise and academic expertise and technical expertise to manage uh, innovative energy projects and finally students are consistently one of the most concerned constituencies concerning climate change. So you have a, a population that really wants to get involved and help with reducing the emissions from the university. And one good example of this is Keele University. This was a highly suitable university for demonstration projects, firstly because it's a campus university uh, and so new projects can be rolled out quite easily and they have a smart, smart energy network demonstrator program which they say is the first facility in Europe for at scale living laboratory research and development and demonstration of new smart energy technologies and services in partnership with business and industry. And they have many projects. Uh, one of the most interesting is they're aiming to demonstrate hydrogen for home heating they can do this because they have their own private gas network, so it makes it more suitable than rolling it out elsewhere. 
And in the UK, because we have an extensive natural gas network and most homes use natural gas, one option for decarbonizing heat in the UK is to replace the methane in our gas network with hydrogen. But we need to prove this as a concept first. And so demonstration projects like at Keele University are very important. And just to conclude my sec section, we would like to run a quick poll, which is the subject of our webinar. So do you believe community energy will have a large role to play in our future system? So please vote now, and at the end of the session, we will give you the results. And now I'd like to pass on to Andre, who will talk about how community energy might scale up. Thanks, Matt. Um, so in this section, I will cover what is the current footprint that we have today uh, in community energy, and therefore, what is the market potential for community energy? Uh, what are the technical innovations that are currently being explored? Um, what business models are also innovating and, and changing? Um, we, I'm going to show you how community energy is actually designed for scale, and then what needs to happen uh, to support uh, this scale up. So as Matt um, highlighted earlier, um, this, the current capacity of community energy, certainly in the UK, is, is fairly small. So we have 168 megawatts of electricity, 2 megawatts of heat, um, and what that means is that it actually has a really small uh, percentage of the current installed capacity for both power and heat. Um, so that means that the current development is small, but it also means the current market available is quite big. Uh, so 99% of the market is available to community energies to increase into. Um, we, we know that the installed capacity is currently changing, so a lot of uh, existing power stations are being decommissioned, uh, and we need new uh, sources of uh, power and heat. Um, it is expected that between now and 2030, in order to achieve our decarbonization targets, uh, 700 billion pounds needs to be invested. Um, so this is a significant investment, a significant amount of technologies and installations um, that need to be deployed. Uh, so there's potential, uh, uh, there's plenty of growth potential and tailwind for community energy to benefit from this and to grab a bit more of that market share um, of, of this energy sector. Uh, now, there might be some limitations around access to capital, um, but the potential at least is there. There's, there's some barriers that we need to address. Um, so there's also a lot of technical uh, innovation that we can deliver. Um, so, so far we've seen solar and wind being deployed in multiple community energy projects. So the majority of the projects you, you saw up there um, the 168 megawatts, the majority of that comes from solar and wind. Uh, but there are a number of new um, technologies being explored by different community groups. Um, uh, some are harder than others uh, to understand and model, um, but uh, they're at least being piloted and tested, um, and maybe this is where those universities come in, um, where you know, some of this might be, might be useful to test. Uh, but it's important to us that regardless of which technologies are being applied, they will require technical expertise. It will need engineers for scale, and engineers can also use community groups to learn and test technologies. Um, so I can speak from experience. I'm currently exploring three uh, of the bullet points above. Um, and so community energy is, is a great hub for innovation and experimentation. Uh, we've, so, we've covered some of the models um, at the beginning that it's not just about owning local assets. Uh, and if we look at current, you know, outside of the energy space, if we look at other uh, innovations across the sector, you can look at like Uber and Airbnb, Netflix, um, and the secret sauce in their business models um, are slightly different. Uh, so uh, in, in the energy space, there's a lot of regulation that doesn't allow for those models to be applied, uh, which is probably why we haven't seen uh, a killer app or a killer business model um, that will disrupt the sector. Um, 
So we have a highly regulated space, and so these models can only evolve as fast as the regulator allows for them to evolve. Um, and so, but here's some of the models that we're, we're seeing emerging uh, over time. Uh, so energy as a service, so this is a model uh, that we've seen with mobile phones and, and broadband, um, where you pay a, a monthly fee and you can use as much um, a, a, within a, a certain, as much as you want within a certain agreed limit. Um, and so you, you know, you pay 30 pounds a month and you can consume up to certain kilowatt, hour, kilowatt hours a month. Um, and some energy companies are exploring this, particularly in the heat sector, uh, more so than the uh, power sector. Um, and, uh, and even th there's some variations of this model where maybe they can guarantee a certain temperature range inside your home uh, for a fixed price, for example. So there's some, some innovations around uh, these uh, business models. Um, the other one is community self-consumption. So that was that um, the one that we defined with the EU is looking at. Uh, and there's a lot of regulation changes happening in that space that will enable this uh, business model to to become uh, more widely used. And this is where communities can consume from local assets. So it could either be again uh, either a local wind turbine that a local village can consume from, or uh, a communal uh, solar installation in a block of flats. Um, and so th there's quite a lot of regulation um, uh, innovations um, and and so look out for this space because that this is a very active space um, and th there are some companies already exploring this within existing regulatory frameworks uh, out there uh, public and local partnerships so this is where local authorities are actually starting to interact with communities. They actually, they realize they don't have the capacity and the knowledge to deliver these projects themselves. So they want the project to deliver more social outcomes. And so they're starting to partner with community groups. And so there's uh, a few examples out there of this. So Project Leo that Matt mentioned earlier is a good example of that. We're starting to see a lot more collaboration um, and integration of local authorities with community groups uh, to deliver local energy projects and so we move on to what are the routes to scaling? Um, community energy actually has a really natural positive feedback loop. Uh, it's naturally designed for scale. Um, so what you can see in this diagram is a network effect. Uh, so a network effect is an effect that happens when the more people that it participate, the more people it attracts. So uh, if you think about Uber, for example, the more, um, the more people that use their service, the more drivers, um, and, and vice versa. So, um, so it's, it's kind of a growing, um, a, a, an exponential growth. Um, and so that's what we see in Community Energy. It's naturally designed for this exponential growth, whereby the more projects are delivered, uh, the more social impact, uh, that's what people really care about, uh, and the more funding it attracts, and therefore there's more engagement from more people from society, um, and that leads to more people having more knowledge, and with more knowledge comes more projects. And so there's a vicious circle um, happening here. And so this is, this is great to understand, and I think this is why a lot of people in, like Mintianji, and it's also why the n amount of people participating in community energy has been growing exponentially. So something that we haven't really mentioned in the, in the numbers earlier from the, the State of the Sector report is the amount of people that are currently actively engaged with community energy. Uh, so I think the current number is about 100,000 people in the UK currently involved in some way, shape or form. Um, and this is fantastic because if we think about energy, it's not really been uh, a lot of engagement with people have been really disengaged with energy. Uh, you just pay the bills at the end of the month and, uh, and that was it. And now there's a much more uh, engaging um, system that where, where people can participate and, and do more and be more proactive about where their energy comes from um, and, and how it's financed. And so how can we actually fuel this? So if it's naturally an exponential system, how can we 
help it grow even faster. Um, so I think one of the routes to success is make it very easy to replicate. So if this is about people participating and copying models from other, you know, other community groups, we need to make it very easy for a new community to copy and paste. And so, you know, from a technology perspective, um, you know, what are the technologies that are currently profitable? How do we model for the local conditions? So how can a community understand? Uh, and I think this is the role for engineers. So can we provide checklists maybe for communities? Can we provide Excel tools uh, or software for people to easily model, um, you know, what would a particular technology look like in uh, a specific environment, in a specific community? Um, so, for example, PBGIS uh, is a tool that was, it's a, it's a tool, a software tool to model solar performance uh, for a given set of conditions. And this has been really valuable uh, for, for communities to predict performance of solar panels and therefore what is the business case that then sits behind uh, those, those projects. And this has enabled communities to build financial models, raise an investment, and do these projects. So I see a role for engineers to engage with the local community groups to do this. From a business model, you know, how will it make money? Um, how can money be raised for these projects? Um, this is of particular importance to if we're asking local people to invest in these schemes, um, you know, people we know, our friends and families, etc., um, and neighbors. We we want to make sure it's a stable model, uh, and we want to make sure it will make money. Uh, or at, at the very least, not lose money. Um, so again, in order to facilitate the replication, is there any open source models uh, that we can share uh, that to save these communities to either have access to financial expertise um, or to build their own models? Um, and so uh, this is actually something I've done recently. So if anyone is interested, I've actually um, shared a, a post uh, feed and tariff model for solar uh, that was delivered through Community Energy London. Um, and if so, if you search Community Energy London and post a feed and tariff model, uh, you might be able to find a spreadsheet uh, and a presentation um, to, to show you that. And again, this is valuable um, if you know if we can share these models. If someone has other models, maybe for wind or for biomass or some other technologies that might be applicable to other communities, then we should be sharing and creating common models that we can all um, discuss and have a common language for discussing the financials. From a setup perspective, uh, this has come a long way um, in the last few years and it's probably out of the, these four topics, uh, the one that's most widely covered for replication. So there's a uh, there's many guides and simplified company structures that allow community groups to raise capital without, you know, having heavy regulation. Um, and so, you know, getting planning and network operator permission to install um, has become a bit more streamlined, the processes behind those. Uh, and there are bodies like Community Energy England, uh, Co-op UK, and uh, Community Shares Unit that provide a lot of support uh, for new organizations, um, so you, you can look to them for support if you're trying to set up your your own project uh, in the UK. Uh, and then the last element is ongoing management. So some of these projects last 20 to 30 years, and they need a very stable plan for the ongoing management um, to ensure that performance remains high, but also that the benefit is being delivered to the local communities. So many smaller groups rely on volunteering, uh, to manage these projects, and this is not sustainable. I believe that digital technology can really help us uh, streamline a lot of the processes behind this, um, and this has been actually the focus uh, this year. Uh, I've been building software to deliver exactly this for community groups. Um, so I'm really excited about community energy. Uh, it's finally getting a lot of people interested, so we're now leveraging 100,000 pe 100, people uh, and there's a network effect happening. There's more people. I can see a lot of momentum. Uh, the policy uh, advisors and, and uh, policy teams and government are excited. Um, and the more people that we can engage around this, uh, the easier we can make for them to engage. 
the better. Let's reduce the amount of acronym we use in the sector uh, and technicalities and so that local people can benefit and deliver what we all care about, which is uh, the social impact. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Well, that concludes the formal presentation. Uh, we'll now move on to looking at your questions and answers. Um, I should say, if we don't get to your specific question, our contact details are on the screen right now, our email addresses, and you can follow me at MattRooney11 <laughs> on Twitter. Uh, so let's take a look at your questions. So lots of questions coming in, uh, many, many questions, so apologies we don't get to them all. I'll just address a couple of comments. Uh, first, we were rightly chided for not including reference to uh, community uh, grants and loans in Scotland. So there is the Community and Renewable Energy Scheme CARES in Scotland, which we also should have made reference to. We're a bit Westminster focused here. And also there was a comment on our poll saying it depends, community energy will depend on which country you're in and whether it's rural or urban. And so that's an interesting comment that we, uh, we should have taken into consideration. Uh, now, this is a question for Andre. Um, so where can I go if I want to start a local energy project, Andre? Uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a few different uh, places. So I would start with Community Energy England. They have a lot of resources, um, a lot of case studies. Uh, if you're actually just trying to get something set up, company structures and all that kind of governance and legal side of things, Community Shares Unit is a good place to go to. Uh, but I would say the best uh, starting place is go and speak to an existing group that either you're trying to replicate or if you're tr trying to learn, just join that group um, you know, and, and volunteer with them for, for a while um, so you can, you can learn about what they're doing to then replicate that elsewhere. Okay, thanks, Andre. Um, there's also a question about saying where should the 700 billion investment in centralized and local re -energy, renewable energy generation go? Uh, should it all go in local renewable energy schemes? It's the position of the IMEC is that we need a mix, so we will need large power stations and large facilities as well, but we think that, that local and community energy can also play a role in our, our energy system. Uh, and sorry, just going through your questions. I, I can I can uh, go deeper on that on the 700 billion. That's just a figure I got. Uh, I can't remember. I got it from a report um, a while back, and I think the majority of that money is is targeted to be spent on offshore wind. Uh, again, wind and solar I think played a, a big proportion of those uh, towards the decarbonisation target. But there's obviously still you know you still got. Uh, you know, nuclear in that mix. Uh, there's a few other, a few other technologies that, um, and also considering, I think that excluded. I think that was just for power. It, it actually excluded heat. So, um, you know, basically, there's a lot of money that needs to be invested if we want to achieve our decarbonisation targets. Yeah. Just another question here, which I think is very good. Do you think the topic is spoke about enough within the media? And I think my answer to that would be in the national media. Certainly not. Um, when various organisations and government go around and offer free heat pumps and things to people, they, there is a very low take-up, so people aren't as engaged as I think they should be. Um, Andre, what do you think about that in terms of promotion of community energy in the media? Yeah, I think the majority of people don't understand what community energy is or what it's about. Uh, I, I would raising the awareness would only help get more people excited and and trying to do more and engaging. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think it's sp spoken about enough. Um, so any ideas? <laughs> Very welcome. <laughs> yes, please do still keep giving us your comments if you have any ideas. Um, another question here probably for Andre as a developer, how much is it engineering versus other challenges to develop these projects? I mean, that was discussed in the presentation a little bit, but can you expand on the engineering versus the maybe project management and finance challenges? Yeah, there's certainly a, like a role for engineers to scope projects, uh, help identify suitable sites, uh, help with modeling and, and performance analysis. Um, you know, that all feeds into the financial uh, case for that particular project. 
Uh, but I would say most of the challenges that community energy projects face are non-engineering challenges, as you know, as you described uh, in your in your presentation. Um, but there, there's certainly a role for engineers, and there is a a need for engineers. I think, um, yeah, someone was asking also a question about you know how can the IMACI maybe support um, and, and, and become you know maybe a facilitator for that, um, which I think is an interesting proposition. Sure. Um, I've got a question here saying which universities are innovating in this area. I think lots of universities are interested. One that we highlighted uh, was Keel University. So Keel is a campus university and often it's, it's easier for campus universities to innovate in this area than if you're in a university embedded within a city, for example, because uh, Keel in particular, it has its SEND, so Smart Energy Network Demonstration Program. And one of the highlights of that is they're going to trial hydrogen for home heating because they have their own independent gas network, which makes them highly suited for that. So for our international listeners, the UK is seriously considering switching over from our, our methane natural gas network, which is used for about 85% of our households to heat their home. If in the long term, we could switch that to low carbon hydrogen. That would be one option for uh, decarbonization, decarbonizing our home heating uh, system. So a question, maybe Andre can take this, uh, do you recommend any good blogs, books, info, or resources you can recommend to a beginner to get up to speed and setting up the technical side of community energy prog projects? And I know you listen to podcasts as well, Andre, are there any good resources you can point people to? Again, um, I think I listed some of those uh, to another question earlier. Uh, the best one is other groups. Go and speak to a group that you want to replicate what they're doing. Um, and most most often than not, uh, they will support it. For people who are actually already trying to do some of this, Community Energy England actually has a practitioner's um, consortium. So basically, people who are actively already doing projects, uh, and they, they basically they help each other out with, with common problems that, um, you know, people come across in different projects. So again, there's, there's a big network around. It's just a matter of, of getting started, connecting. Yeah, great. Okay, so another question we've got, uh, does the IMACI have any capacity to offer a pro bono technical advice service for the early stage of community energy project? So we don't have this formalized at the moment, but we know our energy environment and sustainability group, which Andre is a part of, we also have a renewable power committee. So these are volunteer members that get together and hold events and write policy reports from us, and we have a, a deep well of expertise, and I know they would be interested in offering this sort of technical advice, and it's something that the IMACI should be doing. So I would encourage you to go on our website and look at the, the different groups we have and engage with the, the chairs of, of those groups to see whether there could be some sort of collaboration. Nothing to add on that, Andre? No, yeah, just get, get in touch if, yeah, if there's any, any particular support. Um, yeah, come, come to those groups or, or the IMAC key, and then if, if we don't have the right people in the team that might be able to advise, maybe we can at least ask the question to to the groups if anyone wants to provide that pro bono support. Um, you know, someone might actually volunteer to do that. Sure. Okay, a question which I'm not going to answer directly because it's a controversial, uh, controversial debate that's ongoing. What are the relative economics of centralized versus local energy infrastructure? And I know this is a, a debate that rages on because the, the economies of scale are real. So large power plants will often have uh, a lower cost than smaller ones, but then there are also distribution losses which might reduce the economics of large power stations and large systems. But in, if you look in our report, we, we point to local energy where it has particular use is in the beginning is remote island uh, areas which might be off the gas grid or off the electricity grid. And this is where local and community energy has really taken off. But we we have seen solar and wind in particular come down in cost to an extent that local solar schemes are becoming increasingly competitive with, with uh, traditional uh, forms of electricity. 
Yeah. It's a hot button issue. Andre, would you like to comment on any of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, even when we spoke earlier about the investment that needs to be made uh, around decarbonization, you know, the, the big chunk of, of capital will go to, you know, large scale production of, you know, offshore wind, for example. Um, I do see a role for community groups, for example, if, if they're building an offshore wind farm next, uh, you know, next to uh, a community, uh, you know, and then you're going to have that on your landscape. I think these projects should at least open up um, some of that benefit towards local, either guarantee a certain amount of the profits generated from those projects to be retained for local community benefit, or uh, allowing the community to invest um, in, in those projects, at least a small a small stake in those projects, so they can also at least financially create a little circular economy around that. Um, so yeah, so I, I do believe that centralization has a, a role to play, as well as the decentralization. There will be a mix, but the large scale needs to also engage with the local communities that they're um, that you know they're influencing. Okay, thanks. So I've got a question about why the IMAC network cannot uh, lead on the development of community energy and fund small scale energy projects. It's an interesting proposition. I don't believe it's something we do right now. We do have. The Stevenson Fund that invests in, in companies, innovative companies in mechanical engineering. So if it was a technology focused company, that might be something that we could do in the future. But I will speak to various groups and see if that was something we'd be interested in doing in the future. Um, I should address something in the presentation that for our international audience about fuel poverty. And fuel poverty is a is a political issue in the UK, whereas for international audiences, it's not some a concept that they're familiar with because it's not really used in other countries. But in the UK, uh, we define fuel poverty as people that have fuel costs that are above average, and when they spend that amount, that leaves their residual income uh, below the official poverty line. And in the report, we point to the fact that uh, remote communities often they're, they're off the gas grid will have much higher levels of fuel poverty than uh, people that live in cities, for example. And where I'm from, Northern Ireland, the, the rates of fuel poverty are very high because people still heat their homes from, from oil and even uh, ghastly things like peat. <laughs> So a question about the Smart Export Guarantee and how it will work. So the, the Smart Export Guarantee at the moment is is quite simple. So the government are going to mandate uh, energy suppliers or electricity suppliers over a certain size to offer a non-zero price to small-scale electricity producers to export to the grid. And they aren't they aren't being very prescriptive about this policy because they want the the energy companies themselves to innovate and to offer smart electricity tariffs and uh, that charge different uh, different amounts for electricity depending on the, the balance of supply and demand to help balance the network. So that will come into force in January and we'll see how it works and the government have promised that they will update that policy and monitor the policy as we go along to determine whether it has been successful or not. Uh, question, what do you see as the main method of generating renewable energy in the community? Um, I guess that's another one that is very geographically dependent. In the UK, most of the subsidies for local energy have gone to uh, solar power through the feed-in tariff. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about the different geographical aspects of community energy and what you think might be the, the innovative technologies of the future, Andre. Um, no, again, it, 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 it depends on the different communities and the technology available at the time, and also the financial incentives for the different technologies at that particular point in time. Um, you know, so far it's been solar and wind because of the feed-in tariffs. Uh, but yeah, uh, for example, heat it will be an interesting, an interesting space going forward. I can see you know heat pumps uh, being able to deliver maybe um, you know local heat. Uh, Combined with maybe some some power generation to to supply the energy to the heat pumps, uh, the, the power to the heat pumps. Yeah. Okay. Now, if somebody is asking about 
the reliability of a community energy grid. How can a community energy supply match the reliability of performance of our dedicate of a system dedicated run by dedicated professionals 24 hours a day? Now this is again a contentious issue as we're we're moving from a, a very centralised system of distributing electricity that has worked well for uh, 40 or 50 years. We're, we're moving more to a more decentralised system that is more difficult to manage. So I think projects like in Oxfordshire, the project Leo in Oxfordshire is a good way of testing how reliable how reliable these local electricity grids can be as we move from a, a DNO to DSO model that we talk about in the report. But I should also say that this is a, an ongoing piece of work for our power industry division of the IMECI and they're holding an event in our head office on the 28th of November on electricity system resilience. So you go, if you go to the events page on our website, uh, you can find out about that. And if you're based locally close to London, you might be interested in, in going along or getting in touch with the organizers. So I'm afraid we have <laughs> far more questions than I can get to. Um, I think we'll have to wrap it up soon. We'll just give Andre any final comments you want to make. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of questions. I, I don't think we're going to have uh, time to answer. Maybe you know we can try and answer some of those uh, afterwards by email. But um, yeah, uh, thank you so much for all your questions. Uh, this is a very exciting space, clearly attracting a lot of interest. Um, I don't know how we maybe try and gather the momentum that we created here today um, from all the participants, uh, but there's clearly interest. Uh, so maybe something the IMECI can can think about how to you know how to put this into motion and actually help scale the sector. Yes, absolutely. And like we said, our our contact details are on the screen. So please do get in touch if you'd like to take this forward or like to follow up any of the issues you've heard today. And finally, our poll results. I've been told that a. Uh, Around 90% of people think that community energy will form a large part of our future energy system. I think that probably is representative of the audience, but thank you very much for your contribution. And I think we'll have to wrap it up there. So thank you very much for dialing in, and goodbye. <laughs>